The sixth chapter of the book of Romans is going to take us into some new directions. Paul is now becoming much more intense about the realization of how it is that Jesus Christ has died for the sins of the whole world. And out of his death and resurrection, we uh, as, as his followers are the heirs of grace. Uh, that wonderful gift of grace that has been given to us through Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. And by our simple belief, perhaps some days not so simple, but yet our belief, our belief in Jesus Christ's death and resurrection for the sins of the whole world are that which brings us into the kingdom of God. That is the powerful central teaching of the Apostle Paul. But now he raises a thorny issue. If we are a people who have uh, been given grace because of our sinfulness, does that not mean perhaps that the more we sin, uh, the greater the gift of grace is going to be? Uh, that if grace is the uh, is the gift that is offered for sinful behavior. If I sin more, then perhaps uh, I will be one who will receive the blessings of God more. In the uh, early part of the 20th century, uh, the Russian monk Gregory Rasputin taught and lived that idea. Uh, Gregory uh, was uh, a, a colleague of Nicholas, uh, the, the Tsar of Russia, and gain some notoriety through that. He believed that, that those who sin the most require the most forgiveness. Therefore, a sinner who continues to sin without restraint is one who is going to enjoy the grace of God when he repents for the moment. So if I keep repenting over and over again, if I keep uh, uh, sinning and coming, I'm going to receive the gifts and blessings of God again and again and again. Well, Paul comes back to all of this and says, nonsense. Uh, this is not the way it works at all. But rather, the gift of grace is also a gift of responsibility. The gift of grace is one where we have a different relationship now with sin, and he anchors that in the, the sacrament of baptism. And here we, we get into some thorny issues because of our different modes of baptism. But in Paul's mind, when he speaks of baptism, he means of being taken into the water and dunked, uh, and there's different ways, of course, of doing that. We, we foolishly, across the life of the church, believe that some have to dunk, for, dunk forward, some have to dunk backward. But for Paul, the idea was to go under the water. And that wasn't so much a matter of cleansing, that was a matter of dying. As I go under the water, I have died to my old self. I have died to sin. And when I rise, I rise as a whole new transformed person who has a different relationship now to all of life and especially to sinful behavior. I'm, never, I'm not going to be one who has gone through that process of believing that sin has a grasp on me. It does not but rather that it is in my rising again that I have new life and that the old life is far behind me. And I'm going to live that new life with faith and with integrity and with honesty, and I'm going to use it as a way to celebrate once again. Now, this draws us into a whole conversation about baptism and how it is that baptism becomes one of the primary symbols of the expression of our faith. For we United Methodist, uh, we will uh, baptize in all three forms. Uh, we will sprinkle, uh, we will indeed uh, pour, 
uh, and, and, and we will immerse. And in my ministry, I have done all of those. We, we need to understand the origin, though, of infant baptism and the origin of sprinkling. Uh, for the moments of the early church where there was water available, uh, the dunking and along the Jordan River was, was sometimes an iffy uh, situation because there was not always enough water in it. And so the early church in its uh, writing called the Didache uh, expressed the fact that you could really baptize with, with immersion if there were enough water to do that. But if there were not, then, then the, the second alternative was to pour. And then the third alternative was to sprinkle, if not. But the Didache goes on so far enough to say, if you have no water at all, use sand. And there was always sand in the Holy Land. It, it was a way of, of saying that it may not be so much about the mode, but about the power of it. But Paul's putting his finger on the fact that that mode of dying and rising again is a powerfully important one. Now let's come to infant baptism. Uh, we have approached that in different ways in different denominations throughout the life of the church. A believer's baptism, of course, is one where uh, one is not baptized until such time as they're ready to say, yes, Lord, and then make that personal decision for themselves. But for the early church, at a moment, especially around the end of the first century and moving up into the second century, when there were thousands of, of people coming uh, into the life of the church, it was exploding. Uh, remember the uh, great sermon of Peter at Pentecost where he baptized 3,000 in one day. Uh, and so we, we get this massive movement of people coming in, and many times they were families. And so early on, in about the middle of the first century, it began to emerge that, that whole families were being baptized together, which meant father, mother, children. And that's where the whole idea of infant baptism began to emerge, and it was carried on in the life of the church for thousand year, uh, thousands of years, even up until this day. Now, we, we can engage in a great deal of uh, conversation about your story and my story and how you were baptized and how I was baptized and whether I was immersed or whether I was immersed backward or whether I was immersed forward. And, and we can find ourselves entangled in all of that. But for Paul, the thing that is profoundly important in this text is the understanding that baptism, no matter what its form, is that you have died to the old self and you rise to a new one. And in that transformed life, you live out a whole new experience that is faithful to what it is that Jesus Christ, the Lord of the church, has taught, what it is that is the call of discipleship, what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ for healing and transformation in the midst of the world. I've invited a, a good colleague of mine, the Reverend Michael Cantley, who is pastor of St. Luke's United Methodist Church in Martinsburg, uh, to share with me some of his thoughts and some of his perceptions about this whole idea of chapter six, where Paul is talking about transformation and how it is that we are transformed into a new life and how it is that in this moment of baptism, we die to an old self and we rise to a new one. Hey, Mike, it's so good to have you working with us on this uh, study of the Book of Romans and to have an opportunity to chat with us about uh, your own thinking, your own perceptions. Uh, you know, and what, what is it that um, this uh, reading of Romans has done for you? Uh, so if you want to share a little bit about what your uh, 
going on in your head and heart about the book of Romans right now? Absolutely, and I'm honored to join you all in a little conversation about this. You've inspired some deeper reading this time through with Romans. Every time we read it, something new happens. Yes, yes. Oh, Ed, I, mm-hmm. I hope to share a little of my own testimony before we're done, how this letter affected my life 30 years ago. Oh. But this reading in particular, I think it's been wonderful to kind of not approach it as a systematic theology mm-hmm. or a treaty about religion. Mm-hmm. So often in our churches, I tend to think anytime Romans is brought up, we almost think it in a creedal sense. Mm-hmm. It's a big mm-hmm. bottle full of theology. Mm-hmm. But you know, Pastor Paul, missionary Paul, never wrote into a void, a theological vacuum. He wasn't just blogging and hoping somebody would click onto that and read it. You know? I, I wonder what Paul would do with blogging. I know, right, right. I, I feel like Leander Keck helped me this time as he introduced it. I, in my Bible, this is just the HarperCollins mm-hmm. study Bible, NRSV. Okay. Leander Keck says the occasion for Paul's writing is you've got Jewish people who feel Paul has abandoned them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm taking this good news out to the Gentiles. Although this is the Jewish heritage, Mm -hmm. way back to Abraham. And and he keeps struggling with that. Right. All the way through. Exactly. And they're they're feeling abandoned by Paul. The Gentile Christians are ready to abandon the Jewish people for not accepting Mm -hmm. Jesus the Messiah. So just that setup to think Romans is not abstract theology, stuck on a blog for whoever stumbles by. It's to real communities in conflict. And that's the word I want to get at, is conflict. Yes. And you have community and conflict here. And, right. and Paul's writing to see what he can do to help them to understand, not only from the Jewish side, where right. they need to re- retread themselves in many ways, but also to help the uh, Gentile community understand a little bit more deeply what's going on. Absolutely. I so admire Paul. Yeah. My, my dad had that love for Paul. So as kids, he would keep us steeped in a lot of Pauline okay. reading and yeah. that kind of stuff. And still, I never experienced Romans from this context okay. that you all have started. As I went at it this time and went with Leander Keck's mention of what this occasion is, it really meant so much different to me. Every line begins to take on a new fascination for me. For example, as Paul opens, you can hear him establishing ground between the two parties. Mm-hmm. This glorious God made us all. Mm -hmm. This glorious God gave a freedom to us all. As he talks Mm -hmm. about, he gave them up to these desires or these actions. We've so often read that as if God just turned his back on everything. But Paul is uplifting this glorious God who gives agency. And it was an act of love. An act of love, yes. And and that's what Paul was trying to get at. And I think we look at it as as so much of a... uh, a pejorative, uh, disciplinary, uh, you can, you can't. And that's yes. not what Paul was doing at all. I agree. I agree. And, and one of the things I think that, that strikes me is how pastoral he is, and especially in the sixth chapter, uh, because he's raising questions and perceptions that are very foundational to us as we enter into faith. Yes. And I, and I, I love this great debate you know, that he, he deals with here on the idea that, um, hey, if God has uh, so blessed me with uh, this grace that I get at the moment of of my forgiveness, as God has blessed me so gloriously, why don't I just keep on? And I'll bet you many, many of our Christians as we enter into the faith raise that question. That's not a new question. Not for Paul and the Church of Rome. It's It's not a new question for us now. Right? That, you know, if, if I can keep on sinning, if I, and oh, yes. I, I'm, I'm going to get it, I'm just going to get the goodies. Yes. You know, God's going to keep blessing me. Yes. And, and so that whole idea of, of being uh, um, sin-free right. is kind of uh, difficult. It is. I Try this on for size. See what you think. I, you know, I could be chasing a rabbit here, but it, this could be a meaty rabbit as well. Yeah, just yeah. See what you think about this. If Leander Keck takes us down a good avenue, Pastor Paul, missionary Paul, is writing to that conflict, the Jewish community and the Gentile Christian Mm -hmm. community. 
all of them struggling with how to deal with one another. Mm -hmm. If you can imagine Christians in conflict, yeah. you know. <laughs> it, it happens. <laughs> right, so Paul establishes common ground from the get-go. God made us all. God gives that agency to all. And chapter 2 opens, so who are we to judge anyone? Mm -hmm. God is the judge. Yeah. He reminds them through chapters 3, 4, and 5 of this, this law was God's shalom, mm -hmm. God's dream for folks, you oh, know. Grace keeps coming through. Yes. I, yes. I mean, the whole letter is still exactly. grace. We, we Gentile folks are still part of that heritage because Abraham was given this new life by faith. Mm -hmm. We too are able to be part of this family by faith. To the Jewish people, he continues to remind them, you've had the law and to a great extent, it's just underscored our mm -hmm. sinfulness and mm -hmm. our need for mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. But by the time we get to, to chapter 6, when we continue to keep that context in mind, that there's a community in conflict, notice how different it sounds. Kind of like you called it the unknown opponent. Mm -hmm. I, I love how Paul gently, and from a distance, yeah. he still hadn't been to Rome, but he has the ability to speak to the conflict and say, so what do we say? We're to keep on sinning? Mm -hmm. Heaven forbid we keep on breaking the shalom God dreams for us. And, and Paul is so good at that particular style of writing. Yes. Where he sets up this opponent. Yes. And gets into dialogue with this right. opponent. Right. And it's a great literary style. Absolutely. You wonder if sometimes yeah. if he's heard those phrases from some of the people yeah. in the community. Yeah. Goes ahead and claims that and puts it into his, to remind them, I know what you're thinking. Yeah. Um, but heaven forbid we would keep on breaking God's dream for the beloved community. Mm -hmm. Keep on breaking God's desire for us to live in this shalom that he mm -hmm. made this place mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. Heaven forbid we keep on sinning. That, there, it's almost an epitome of the way we make this abstract theology when we say, do we still have grace to be saved again? It's almost as if that's, that's not the point. We're to live in that beloved community. And the power of that beloved community, which is something that he wants his Jewish brothers and sisters to yes. capture again, that the law really did bless them. Amen. Uh, but it's not a blessing to be used as a tool against others. That's exactly right. Uh, and, and that uh, my Gentile friends, you know, let, let's talk about this new life that you get. Right. So you get all those pieces together, and those are glorious moments for him. Exactly. And, he, and, and he wants them to hold on to that, mm -hmm. no matter which side of the fence they're sitting on. Yes. Sorry. I hear some of, some of the most traditional lines we pull out of Romans in new light to hear it in the two parts. Mm -hmm. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. To hear that as a pastoral exhortation, looking at the two parts. He, mm -hmm. he loves these people, even though he hadn't necessarily come to the community yet. He knows mm -hmm. people like Priscilla. Mm -hmm. who may have gone back to Rome by this time. Mm -hmm. But you can hear a pastor reach out and, and say, we all have sinned, broken this shalom God desires for us. Mm -hmm. We've fallen short of the glory God desires for us to have together. So it sure takes on new life. You get to, that's way back in chapter 3. Yeah. You get to chapter 6 with us, and I'm reminded of Clarence Jordan, who wrote the Cotton Patch oh, Gospel. Oh, yeah. Oh, Great. Yes. Oh, this is... Clarence Books, was yeah, so. such a wonderful interpreter of yeah. Greek New Testament. But the way he talks about chapter 6, he said, let me remind you all, we once lived in this, I think he calls it the death job. We were on the clock with a death job. But now through Christ, we've got a harmony job. Mm -hmm. Something we can do together. We're mm -hmm. called into a new life and a new way of being on the job together. And that's where Paul is saying, hey, you, you need to stay with this idea of being in grace. Yes. You need to stay with that and understand yes. that once you have uh, been saved, once you have asked for forgiveness, once, once you have embraced the Christ, now your life has been transformed. You yes. are not the same person that you were before. Right. And so talking about being in that old sinful self is foolishness for Paul. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, because the whole idea of transformation, I'm not the same person. That's right. And, and then he uses baptism yes. as, as a way to really get under that and to illustrate that. 
And, and one of the things that I struggle with, um, and I've talked about this with, uh, in, my, in this Bible study up to this particular point with my friends, um, that you know, we have really shaken the whole idea of baptism so badly, we're not sure where we stand with it anymore. Right. Um, we look at the whole idea of, of being baptized as uh, sprinkling, and so dying and rising again, gets lost in that. Yes, yes. And, and so, you know, our own baptismal traditions don't always help us very much to really capture what it is that Paul is saying. And so some of our friends, though, have, have used baptism as a way of saying, this is not about washing away your sin. That's not what it is. Right. It's dying to the old right. self. Right. And rising to a new self. And that whole idea of transformation. I'm a new God. Yes. You're a new gal. Yes. You're whoever you are. We have a, a new way of knowing life. Yeah. That was the old J. Lewis Martin thing about the mm -hmm. cross. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. J. Lewis Martin called it the turn of the ages. That mm -hmm. cross is where we got a new understanding of who God is. Mm -hmm. A new understanding of what life is. What mm -hmm. real living is. Mm -hmm. It's paradoxical to think in that death mm -hmm. we learn what real life is. Right. So Paul, every time he... Seems to bring up death, death in Christ, which connecting with baptism, connecting it with the way of Christ. It, it's not a static event so often in Paul's mm -hmm. rhetoric. The cross life or the cruciform life, mm -hmm. and my Sunday school teacher used to say, is life now shaped like Jesus. Mm -hmm. ah, so rather than... That's that transformation. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. So baptism brings us into that. We're joining in that new job, that harmony job, Clarence, yeah, yeah. Jordan says. So. So. And, and Paul does such a great job with that all the way through. And, and you're right, he sets the stage for that early on in the first chapter, where he begins to say that uh, Christ has called me, and Christ is in me. Mm -hmm. And he's very powerful mm -hmm. about that, and the way that he defines his apostleship, the way that he defines... You know, his servanthood, the way that he said he set himself, himself set apart. Yes. That whole idea that I am a new person now. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that was a critical kind of transformation, you know, for him at that so what, what better person to be yeah. this bridge builder between the yeah. Jewish community? He was a, an enforcer. Yeah. Love for the love of God. Yeah. An enforcer in the Jewish tradition. And now, because of Christ. A bridge builder, yeah. so all of us could be in on it. That's right. I, who was it that said about peacemakers, though? Were they bridge builders? You know what happens to bridges? They get walked on by the people on either side. You know. What is the last yeah. verse of chapter six? Ed? I, there's something really stuck out to me about um, when I read this in the context of community. Now. At the 25th verse, yeah. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's another one of those Romans Road easy pulls yeah. from, from this letter. Great it's quoting stuff. It's great quoting stuff, right? You 323 or so, mm -hmm. all have sinned and come short of the glory. Yeah. And we, we acknowledge that when we said, imagine that pastor talking to these two factions. All of us have sinned. So like he had said a little earlier, let's not be judging one another. That's right. Let's be holding one another, living in this shalom God desires. Because we're all new. We've yes, all been exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Now that we've been free from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage we get is sanctification, that growth together. The end is eternal life, eternal and abundant. For the wages of sin is death. We, we begin to be complicit in the death of God's shalom among us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our separation from the one who made us and from one another. But the free gift of God is that eternal and abundant life mm -hmm. in Christ's spirit, in Christ Jesus our Lord, if we'll let him govern our, ourselves and our communities. Right, so looking at it in that, in a very practical kind of way to Mike with that, one of the things that says to me is we really have to be present on Good Friday. Yes, sir. We cannot escape that. Yes. We need to be at that cross where we enter into the death. Oh, yes. Where we enter into the death of not only uh, Christ dying for the sins of the whole world, but entering into the death of our own sinfulness. 
And if, yes. and if we don't stand, you know, with, with you know Christ on Good Friday, I'm sorry. Sunday morning don't mean anything to you. Amen. Yeah. Because you've got to be there, you know, at the point of death on Good Friday. Yes. And you strike a nerve that runs straight to my heart. Mentioning this, mm -hmm. I feel like in our churches we separate Good Friday and the cross from our actual living. We've we've touched this that paradoxical notion. Notion in Christ's death we find our life. You're you're yeah. touching that yeah. Yeah. right there. I heard Leslie Newbigin say this one time. I wish I could as eloquently relate it, but. There's something in our world, as we become more and more polarized, more and more, uh, we watch the political climate, we watch the way the culture pushes against each other anymore. Leslie Newbigin was a Church of Scotland yeah, yeah. man, a bishop to yeah, India for yeah, yeah. years and years, so brilliant, brilliant yeah. evangelist, uh, yes, and a brilliant thinker. Yeah. He said, in a world, I think this is his book, the gospel in a pluralist mm -hmm. society. Mm -hmm. So he said, how can we meet one another in all mm -hmm. our differences? I thought it was so profound. He said, we meet one another best, most authentically at the foot of the cross. Mm -hmm. So not just in observation of what Jesus is doing, this is a way of humbling ourselves like our Lord mm -hmm. before one another. Mm -hmm. There is something that moves even beyond the bounds of Christianity. It gives yeah. us an ability yeah. to share Christ's way in humble submission. Yeah. Meeting and I, and I think like that's what Paul was doing here yes. with this whole emphasis on baptism and death. Yes. So you know we, we we want to jump on a uh, rise into life, but we can't do that without understanding we had to die first. Amen. And Christ had to die first before he could rise on Easter Sunday morning. Amen. And so separating the, those out, not just Good Friday and Easter, but even our own going under the water and dying to our old self and rising to a new self it is, it is the parable that works for us too. That's right. That is right. Yeah. How has, has Roman touched your life though? You know, you mentioned it earlier, it has some real powerful personal story for me. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. I, I would be interested in that. <laughs> well, I'll try to do a short version, Ed. I was a person raised in Jesus' life, wonderful parents to this day, faithful parents to this day. I grew up in the Methodist cousin church in the Nazarene church. My, my parents kissed so cousins. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. So... Rejected all of that as a teenager, pushed against it, kind of was a very staunch humanist, and loved Stoic theology, uh, Stoic kind of philosophy. Mm -hmm. You know, I could mm -hmm. argue your theology as good as any hard headed mm -hmm. Jack Mule you'd run into, mm -hmm. probably, you know, but I wanted to drive. I wanted to do my own thing. I didn't want to be affected by this humble religion of fools that I had kind of started to interpret it as. Well, you can imagine how far that got me as a, into my early 20s. I had pretty much wrecked my life with my own driving. And I had become so confused noticing how I'd grown up there or all these other traditions. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh my word, I'm, I'm about shaking up my ability to even know how to pray. We've got Islam, we've got Judaism, I've tinkered in all these humanist philosophies. However, Ed, I just cried out to the Creator. I thought this is the only way around all of this confusion, is crying out to the Creator and letting the Creator know, if you're there, I need you. Okay. If, you're, if you're not behind life and reality, I'm ready to get out. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very desperate, it's a joy to share with people now how God showed up mm -hmm. in that situation. But Brother, it gives me chills to think of how empty life was, how desperate mm -hmm. I was. So God did show up. I'll spare you some of the details, but I wound up in a halfway house in Louisiana. Within a couple of weeks, this experience happened. I'm sitting in a room, being a part of a drug treatment 
program, but at night I was reading the Bible and looking up into the corner of the room and speaking to that Creator. So thankful for some help, a few days clean, mm -hmm. and saying into the corner of the room, God, I grew up hearing about faith. Mm -hmm. Grew up hearing about faith. I, and I'm interpreting that as the assurance and confidence to just keep putting one foot in front of another. And I need that. If you'd help me with some faith, I could sure use it. I didn't know if I was interpreting that correctly or not. But Ed, an old King James Bible, likely a Gideon Bible in that, in that mm -hmm. halfway house, stopped me at Romans 14. Mm -hmm. Something stopped me. Mm -hmm. And the old King James language was to the effect of, Welcome ye him who is weak in the faith. Ah. And I said, what? I looked back into that corner, looked back, N knowing just enough about Paul's context, there was a temptation to write it all off. You know, like I said, I'd grown up, my dad loves Paul, and we heard a lot about Paul as kids. I knew he wasn't writing. We're reading someone else's mail, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. although what a treat and mm -hmm. how God blesses us mm -hmm. through this stuff. But I could have written all that off that night. But I treasured it, and I thanked God for it. Welcome ye him who's weak in the faith. And over these years, that was 1987, and over these years I've hung on to that. What an important chapter, even, even in my next steps through that season. I hung on to the rest of that sentence. Welcome ye him who's weak in the faith, but not to doubtful disputations. I began to embrace more of that where I could have even shared my experience with God and other Christians, we can talk one another out of what we're experiencing with God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We quarrel as Christians a lot. Mm -hmm. This Romans 14 has gained more and more importance for me, mm -hmm. noticing how Paul was a peacemaker between people of faith. Paul the pastor. Paul the pastor. Romans 14 has such great wisdom for us, timely wisdom even for today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, welcome you him who's weak in the faith, but not to doubt for disputations. Some regard this day of the week as sacred. Others, another day of the week. Whatever day of the week we regard, let us regard it unto God. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Some feel like they can eat meat. Others, who may be weaker in the faith, have a different take on faith, abstain. Let's not put down those who partake. Let's not, if we abstain, put down the other side, is what he's saying. Let's each offer what we offer unto God. Mm -hmm. what, a, what a beautiful chapter. Oh, yeah. The power of Paul. Yes. The pastor who turned your life around. Yes. And, and you joined with a whole bunch of others like John Wesley. Yes. And yes. That, yeah, the whole transformation. Yes. And how God enters in. And that's what mm -hmm. Paul is doing through this letter. Amen. He is pushing for transformation. Amen. New life. Dying to that old self, arising to something that it is absolutely glorious and wonderful. Amen. And that's what we hold on to. Amen. My friend, thank you so much for being a part of Brother, this. Brother, thank you for uh, that uh, opportunity. Uh, I hope that this study of the Apostle Paul is helping you to understand more thoroughly your own faith. That it is guiding you towards some of the thinking of the early church and how this particular apostle of the church guided us and nudged us also, it is a time for us to think about how we find the Word of God fitting in the midst of the world, how we use Scripture, how we use our experience, how we use what is happening about us, how God is impacting us in so many different kinds of ways. It's not easy material in the time in which we live, and yet the Word of God is consistently with us, both in terms of sacred Scripture the writings of the Apostle Paul, and the experiences of God's people. May you continue to grow. May you continue to experience the wisdom and grace of God.